morning. I'm Roger Wadeen, Director of Policy and Education at the Chamber, and I'm joined on stage with Chuck Frederick, who's the editorial page editor for the Duluth News Tribune, our partner and sponsor for the forum. I'd certainly like to welcome our guests this morning, Senator A.B. Klobuchar and Representative Kurt Bills. We're very pleased that they were able to take time out of their busy campaign schedule and join us this morning. Just a couple of comments about the format for our discussion this morning, and we would like to think about it more in terms of a discussion than a debate, per se. We have very important issues, many of them complex, and so we're going to give the candidates ample opportunity to discuss them fully, um, but we have had, just to make sure that we have balance, we've asked Tina in the front row here to keep an eye on the clock and just indicate by the raising of a sign that uh, time is coming to a close so that we can make sure both candidates have equal opportunity to discuss the issues. And we're very pleased this morning to have representatives from the Duluth Superior Communities Foundation Civil Civility Project. They're helping us today to ensure that expectations are met as to the civil discourse that we hope to have. Uh, we intend on having that civil discussion this morning. Uh, we'll not tolerate any disruptive behavior. And if there is any disruptive behavior, we'll ask the officers that have joined us this morning uh, to escort you from the room. Chuck and I will moderate. There'll be no questions from the audience. And we'd ask that you please hold your applause until the end of the discussion this morning. So Chuck, why don't you start us off? Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, we're pleased, uh, this is a, one of three uh, uh, candidate forums at the Chamber and the News Tribune are sponsoring, and of course they're twofold. The one is we're hoping to you know, increase the opportunity for voters uh, to hear from the candidates, to hear their positions, and learn a little bit more before they make their critical decisions on November 6th. Uh, on the News Tribune side, uh, where the editorial board that is, is also determining the newspaper's uh, endorsement positions through these forums. So we thank you for, for being part of that process, and I welcome uh, Representative Bills and Senator Klobuchar. And uh, I think I'd like to just uh, get things started off here, just uh, very, very open-ended, in a very open-ended way, just to ask you to introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about uh, yourselves, your priorities, if elected or re-elected, and uh, talk uh, directly to the electorate uh, that will make a decision on November 6th. We'll start with Senator Klobuchar. Well, thank you very much, Chuck. Thank you, Roger. Uh, thank you, David. It's great to uh, be here, and uh, I am especially impressed by this chamber. I got to uh, keynote your uh, annual event, 1,100 people, a few years back. Uh, it's one of the biggest chambers in the state, and uh, not only that, I love how you've worked with labor and with civic leaders and that you bring everyone uh, together because you see uh, during difficult economic times, you see this as a team effort to really uh, be strong up here in northern Minnesota. So I want to thank you for that. I'm also impressed that Duluth is up and open for business uh, after the horrible flooding uh, earlier this summer. I was incredibly moved by the way Duluth and all of the surrounding communities and the other counties handled uh, that torrential downpour. The fact that uh, uh, we didn't lose lives because so many people in this town, not just first responders, but also uh, just regular citizens, uh, ran toward that torrential waters uh, instead of away from them to rescue people, to save people, to help people. And you seem that see that same spirit uh, in the rebuilding. Obviously, we're working on the federal and state level to get the infrastructure funding uh, to get things moving again. Uh, but I thank you for that and exciting to see what's happening here. Also exciting, uh, the announcement last week of the Maurice's expansion and the office park up here and the work that Mayor Ness has done. Um, I'm proud to have his support as well as the support of uh, the mayors uh, in Virginia and Chisholm Hibbing and others throughout northern Minnesota. And I think if you talk to them about the work that I've done uh, as a senator, uh, you'll find out uh, that what I have done is to put people first and to work on real results for the state of Minnesota. Uh, that means when uh, the uh, Wayne Brandt uh, from the forestry industry calls and says that there's a problem uh, for them because there is uh, wood products coming in from China and other countries uh, that are not only dangerous for health, uh, but also are, create an uneven playing field uh, for our forest industry uh, because they're not meeting our safety standards. I get involved. I get a Republican uh, co-author, Mike, Mike Crapo, 
uh, from Idaho, and we go to work and get a bunch of uh, half Democrats, half senators, and we get that bill passed uh, for the forest industry. Or whether it's when uh, Bruce Kerfoot up in uh, Gunflint uh, Lodge comes to me and says, this is so unfair, we don't have the broadband high-speed internet access, we need to compete with some of our Canadian counterparts. Uh, I went to work and made sure uh, that there's funding for projects uh, like what we're starting to see uh, with Hickory Tech from the Twin Cities to Duluth, as well as the, what, the projects that are getting started in Cook County and Lake County. Uh, uh, whether it's Scott Dane of the trucking industry, uh, whether it is uh, individual people uh, that come to us and can't get their benefits for Social Security or having trouble getting their benefits uh, for their veterans' benefits that they so deserve, I've stood up for them. And so that is how I've looked at my job, that it's real results for real people. One of the things I'm proudest about uh, for this area in northern Minnesota and really throughout our state uh, is that we're making things in America. Things have not been easy up here, but you have never given up. You've certainly never given up with the tourism industry, which is thriving uh, up in northern Minnesota uh, this last year. Uh, you have never given up uh, when it comes to um, all of the issues that we have in trying to get our products overseas and making sure that the Duluth port is thriving. Uh, I truly believe that we need to be a country that makes stuff again, that invents things, that exports to the world. Uh, we have learned that we can't simply rely on churning money on Wall Street, uh, that we have to make things. And you see it with Cirrus uh, proudly now sending their planes uh, to the French Air Force. Uh, you see it with Epicurean, the Luth Pack, where I'm going to be headed uh, right after uh, this forum. Uh, it's really happening up here, and we're seeing it throughout our state. Uh, so what I think we need to do going forward is first of all make sure uh, that we have uh, people who have the right educations that will fill the jobs that we have for the future. Look at the medical school up at UMD um, and you're producing doctors and other health professionals that not just look at going into the big cities but also are willing to work and take up practices in the rural areas. Uh, look at what we see in um, some of the new degrees that are being developed on the range uh, in mining and other things. The education system has to fit where the jobs are. Exports, uh, opening markets for our businesses and making sure uh, that we do everything we can to have an even playing field. Uh, making sure the rules and regulations aren't slowing us down uh, as we go forward and being smart about changes there. And also uh, bringing down our debt in a balanced way, uh, in a way that works for the people of Minnesota. So those are my priorities going forward, and I just want to thank uh, the Chamber uh, and everyone for having me here. It's great to be up in Duluth and to see that Duluth is open for business. Thank you very much, Senator. Representative Bills, I thank you too for, for coming and being willing to, to come up here to what traditionally has long been a, a stronghold uh, for a popular senator. Uh, please kind of tell us a little bit why, why you're a viable alternative. Oh, sure. Well, I'm Kurt Bills. I, I'm from Rosemount, and I teach economics there, and actually uh, by way of Winona State, so um, after 16 years of teaching economics, I, uh, I about eight years into it, in 2008, uh, decided to run for city council in Rosemount because of all the questions that I was getting from students. When you, when you teach economics and, and, you, and you see and, and expose students to the various deficits and debt, whether Republican or Democrat, that our country has, they have lots of questions. And, uh, and those questions can be heartbreaking at times because these young people clearly haven't voted uh, for, for individuals who have, who have caused some of the problems that we have in our country right now. So what I wanted to do was get involved and uh, also went to work on my curriculum and uh, built some curriculum around the schools of economic thought so we can uh, clearly educate, uh, not indoctrinate, but educate our students on the various ways forward so that they can go forward and, and more be, and be a part of our country and, and, our, and our elected process. So I, in, in serving on the city council, I started a youth commission so that young people age, age 14 to 18 could actually get involved in local government. And we actually paid down debt. Uh, the city of Rosemount did, and we were able, able to lower our tax rate in 08 and 09. In 2010, I ran for the state legislature, uh, seeing a $6.2 billion deficit. I thought that would be something that uh, I might be able to bring my skills to, not only being, being an economics teacher. My wife, Cindy, and I run a licensed home child care out of our home, so we are that quintessential small business in a community. So bringing that budgetary uh, knowledge uh, to government uh, has helped quite a bit. We were able to lower our deficit to a surplus and also work together with Governor Dayton uh, to, to, lot, to do lots of great things. I, some of the things I was encouraged by was uh, how we could put together small and, and rural school funding and working with Representative Paul Anderson uh, from over by Alexandria. 
and also working, uh, working together with uh, Representative Brookovina on the school trust lands, something that's been a problem for 34 years now. And uh, as a public school teacher, we need reforms. We need reforms to properly fund our, our classrooms. Uh, I still teach my first hour class at Rosemount High School every morning. Uh, Mr. Cassano is there this morning for me uh, as a substitute. Uh, he's also an economics teacher there. And uh, I have 38 kids in my first hour class. That's shocking. That's appalling. Uh, especially when I know that uh, serving on education on the K-12 Finance Committee, last year we put $50 on the funding formula per student, and this year we put $50 on the funding formula per student. So why are my classes getting so large? We have to really start to take apart, and we need to look at and have proper, proper oversight over the programs that we run so that we can maintain them and have some type of solvency in the future. Um, you, you know, it, it, clearly we need a way forward. We need a way forward that, that is going to be a great compromise. We're going to have to have another great compromise in this country. And we are electing this year in this country the people to put forward to have the debate and to have the discussion as to how to do that. Our country is in an absolute solvency crisis. I've been waiting for 15 years to say some of the things that I'm going to be saying over the next few months. And th this isn't really a, a, an Amy versus Kurt thing. This is, this, this is an America versus DC thing. All right, our country is so out of equilibrium right now. A, a solvency crisis is when you have too much debt on the system, personally, governmentally. That's what we need to, and we do need to move forward in a balanced way, and we can. But we must break the election cycle politics that goes on. Neither side will ever have the majority that they want to move forward with their agenda. So we have to send an independent voice, somebody who's looked into the eyes of kids for 15 years and answered their questions, somebody who has the fortitude to carry things to the Senate floor, uh, somebody who understands the, the constitutional underpinnings of the U.S. Senate and the highest deliberative body in the world and what it should be and, and what it hasn't been the last few years, specifically the last 10 years. We've seen a reduction in floor votes, votes by 47%. We don't, we don't deliberate anymore. We don't have discussions. Oversight hearings are, are non-existent. We aren't doing the things that government is supposed to do. And, and certainly it doesn't give you the greatest photo ops to do the things that, that need to be done to be solvent, but you have to go and be a part of them anyway. So that's why I'm running. I'm running for the kids that I've taught for all these years. I'm running for my children, for my grandchildren that I'll have someday. That's why I'm up here. That's why I wanna have, have this discussion. We, we have to help educate people and, and put forward uh, various ideas that, that, uh, that will help our country move, move along. So, and really be, uh, again, the, the bastion of hope, the bastion of freedom and liberty that it has been. So I thank you for uh, hosting this today. Thank the chamber and, uh, and the playhouse. It's just a, a great spot. What a, what a beautiful setting. And uh, also thank the Duluth News Tribune uh, for being here as well. This is a, this is a wonderful place. I'm pleased to ask you to hold your applause until we're done with uh, this morning's discussion that way, allowing the maximum amount of time for having the discussion. Uh, we touched on it a little bit uh, when we talk about the economy uh, and Congress. We can't avoid talking about things like fiscal cliffs and debt ceilings and sequestration, and yet the seeming inability for Congress to really come to grips with the solution for the problem. Now, Representative Bills if you're successful in being elected, something will have happened by the time you get into office because of the requirement that something be done by the end of the year, but I'm sure the turmoil will be far from over. Maybe you could touch a little bit more on your perspective on the way Congress is handling uh, these tough economic decisions, and then Senator will hear from you. Yeah, I, I just don't see right now from Washington, and this is again, it's not a Republican or Democrat thing, it's about the election cycle, and, and having taught advanced placement uh, micro and macroeconomics and advanced placement government and politics, it's something that I, you know, my wife tells me I should read more fiction because that's all I read about is the economy and our government. And, and I simply put, a, you know, I tell her, honey, the last few years has been like reading fiction. And, and, that's, and we need to break that. And again, it's not, a, it's not a hit on Republicans or Democrats. It's a hit on the system as a whole. We've gone 1,237 days without a budget, uh, specifically a, a budget out of the United States Senate. That can't happen. So, so we need people to work together. I know that Senator Kent, Kent Conrad does not want to retire uh, as a Democrat without a budget. I know that. So there's, there, there has obviously been a discussion somewhere. So where are we standing up in the caucus process? 
Like I stood up when, when the Dougie Johnson fund was on the line and said, this is wrong. This is wrong, a one-time shift. We don't, we don't need one-time shifts any longer. We need to, and I actually voted with Tommy Rukavina on that because he had a great argument. And he was right from the accounting standpoint that we were trying to do a one-time thing to fix our budget. And that's what we need to get away from. So, so we have to move forward. We, we don't need a debt commission. No more commissions. We already have a debt commission. It's called Congress. And if Congress would just do its job, go get, get away from the, the, the process of not having floor debate. I was, I, was, I was able to visit the United States Senate, and I think I might know one, one problem is that they, the senators have to give up their cell phones and, I, and iPads when they walk into the chamber. So maybe that's why we don't have to hold the floor anymore for a filibuster. Maybe we should bring back that rule. Tom Horner and, and Tim Penny have talked about that in their op-eds in the Star Tribune. Bring, bring back the rule where you have to hold the floor in a filibuster, not just threatening it. We have to get away from filling the tree. Filling the tree is a process where the majority leader inserts every amendment into a bill and fills it up so that no other amendments can be offered. That's happened, going on 50 times that has happened with, with Majority Leader Reid. Under Tom Daschle, another Democrat, it happened once. So I want to know where, where are we standing up against these procedures, this, this tyranny of the majority within the bodies, whether it's Republican or Democrat in the House or the Senate. That's what I want to know. Why are we hotlining bills? Hotlining bills is when the phone rings in the senator's office. And if nobody offers an amendment or opposition to a bill, these bills just pass without votes, without debate, without amendments. Why is this going on in the most highest deliberative body in the world? We have to get together. We have to talk. I, I, always, I love to sit next to us, uh, Representative Lesh from St. Paul and Representative Rukavina from, from up here in tax committee. I never sat on the Republican side. I just happened to walk in one day and sit down. I didn't know that you had to pick sides. So I just sat down, and, and, all, and Representative Lesh and Rukavina walked in and sat down next to me. And we had the greatest discussions. Also sat next to Representative Anzels and Representative Davney on K-12 finance. If you want to learn a lot about people, sit next to them. Trust me, as a public school teacher who's a real conservative, I've learned how to talk to people. Okay, there, there are people on, on the faculty and in the staff who we don't share the same ideology. But we can come back to the lunchroom, we can come back to the faculty and staff lunchroom every day and have discussions. That's what you need to get going here, and that's what I'm going to Washington to do. This great compromise will come forward. And even though I am a staunch conservative, when it comes time to vote to put this country forward, I'll make that vote. And I'll make it not for my party, but for all the kids that I've taught. Senator? Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I will say that one of the most frustrating things for me since I got to Washington is the gridlock uh, that we've seen there. Uh, it is the antics that go on. And if you look at the records of where these filibusters are coming from, uh, they are most likely, I, ch I challenge anyone to look at them, hundreds and hundreds of filibusters more than any time in history. Uh, they have come from people who are taking more extreme views, uh, from people uh, that uh, Representative Bills has cited as mentors of him uh, in the Senate. I think we need people who can get real results, who work in the middle, who are willing to get things done. Uh, nearly two-thirds of the bills that I have led have been with Republican co-sponsors. I have proven that I am willing to work with people across the aisle to get things done. Courage in the next few years is not going to be standing alone uh, uh, in the middle of a great debate, giving a speech by yourself. Courage is wh whether you're willing to stand next to someone you don't always agree with for the betterment of this country. Uh, debates are important. But what's really important is real results for real people. And that's why I believe you can't balance this budget on the backs of the people that can't afford it. And that's the middle class and the most vulnerable among us. But what I do believe is that there is a way forward on this debt. And that is why I have worked with a group in the middle. We have about 50 senators now, half Democrats, half Republicans, uh, that are working together on the debt commission. And I don't think that that debt commission uh, is just something silly that's a piece of paper uh, that's sitting on the, uh, on, the, on the wall. It is actually something that people are looking at for guidance of how we move forward with the framework. What is that framework? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a mix of spending cuts and revenue. I supported and voted for the last compromise, which is the Budget Control Act, which was $2.2 trillion in spending cuts, more than we've seen in decades. 
That is what is happening right now in this country. It's not going to be easy, but we are going to have to make some spending cuts. It's also about revenue. I have stood up for six years and called for the Bush tax cuts to continue for the middle class, but for people making over $250,000 that they go to the Clinton levels. Why have I said that? Because I'm worried about the debt, because I know that that will give us $750 billion on the debt. You combine that with spending cuts, you bring down the debt over 10 years by $750 billion. I was willing to stand up for that six years ago when not many people were willing to say that. That's where I think we need to go, plus closing a lot of these subsidies, the oil subsidy, $40 billion in 10 years, negotiating for prices on prescription drugs under Medicare Part D, over $200 billion in 10 years. You can add up the money and get to where we need to go, uh, at least $4 trillion in debt reduction over 10 years. I think that's important for this country, but what's equally important is looking out for this economy and jobs and making sure we don't do something that creates a sharp contraction in our economy. What I fear is some of these things that have been discussed here, uh, like the Rand Paul budget, uh, which uh, Representative Bills has given as his number one priority to get done, opposed by 83 senators, uh, including half of the Republicans, would literally end Medicare as we know it in two years. So I think what you're looking for when you're talking about a compromise is someone that's willing to make that balance. Make sure we keep our economy going as we're seeing in the Duluth area, but also be smart about bringing down our debt. And I did want to clarify the record on the uh, Taconite Fund uh, that Representative Bills uh, when there were two major votes on the budget uh, that he voted uh, to raid that fund twice. Uh, and I think that's important for the people of northern Minnesota to know. I would not have done that. Sure. Thank you. Please, again, applause at the end. Uh, Senator, you touched on the, the Ryan budget, uh, literally end Medicare in two years. And, and I guess I wanted to, to kind of go back to that a little bit. But what would it re be replaced with, and, and why do you support it? Representative Bills. The Ryan budget or the or right. Rand Paul? See, there's, there are many budgets. There, there's the Rand Paul, uh, Jim DeMint, uh, Mike Lee platform to revitalize America. There's Tom Coburn's Back in Black. There's uh, Paul Ryan's Roadmap. Uh, but clearly, see, and this, this is what I've said all along, and, and, uh, and, and Pat Kessler pointed this out actually in our news conference. These are simply my, this is what I think the way forward should be. That's not going to be the way forward, I know that. But I want people to know what my feelings are. And I also want Minnesotans to actually read the platform to revitalize America. It is tough. It is a very difficult thing to, to be able to stand up and say, we need to do these things. All right? Okay, so let's compromise. And instead of, instead of ending the Department of Education, let's zero base the budget out and talk about what the priorities that I need as a public school teacher really are. Why are there 209 STEM programs? 209 separate science, technology, engineering, and math programs. 209 separate ones. Why? So that every little bureaucracy can have their fiefdom? See, I, I don't understand that. And, and as a public school teacher, the, no child left behind, whether it's no child left behind or race to the top, President Bush or President Obama, I haven't seen the value add in my classroom from either of them. And clearly put, it's probably because federal elected politicians, congressmen, congresswomen, and senators, and presidents want to stand next to school kids when they don't want to take the tough votes on entitlements. They don't want to talk about how do we reform the entitlements. Clearly put, the people who are not offering solutions are the people who are going to take Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security off the cliff. And everybody knows it. Uh, whether, whatever actuaries you talk to, if nothing is done, that's how they go off the cliff. You know, Tom Stinson just had a great quote uh, yesterday about where we're going after January 1st, if nothing is done. So let's watch. Let's watch in the next few weeks and let's see what comes out of this Senate. Will the commission put forward a plan? Will they vote on it? Will they have floor debate? I think we all need to watch and see what happens. Will we finally have a budget? Or will we continue down the road of four years without a budget? The Budget Control Act is literally the Budget Out of Control Act. All it does is pull down the trend lines, and the trend lines are still above what GDP is going to grow. The Budget Control Act doesn't even talk about health care at all. The largest cost driver in, in the budget, in, in our spending, I should say, because we don't have a budget, in the continuing resolutions, the largest cost driver is health care, but it's not talked about in the Budget Control Act. So the, and I don't understand why 
why a, a person who, uh, why, why my opponent who's so well liked in the state and has supposedly such huge polling numbers, why, why would she have to attack me and, and call me extreme? I'm a public school teacher. How extreme is that? A guy who's watched for 15 years, a guy who's watched as our, uh, as our elected bodies, Republican and Democrat, have taken our country to this point. And now I want to stand up and go do something about it. And I get called extreme. I think that's extreme. I think what's extreme is to not offer a budget. I think what's extreme is to not offer solutions. In six years, our national debt has doubled. The unemployment rate has doubled. And my housing value has been cut in half. This year, because I'm taking a 0.8 leave, I'm going to actually make a lot less money, and my family will make under $100,000 a year, my wife and I working together, for a family of six. So I, trust me, I'm comfortably within the middle class. Why would somebody from the middle class be standing up? Because I know where the taxes are going to fall. You could tax, if you just get on irs.gov, you can figure it out really quickly. If you would tax 100% of all income above $250,000, you would come up with about $1.4 trillion. And that would fund the government for about 141 days. Where do you go then? I know, as a middle class individual, it comes down on me. Like Tom Stinson said, if nothing is done, it would be like, these are, this is our state economist quote, if nothing is done in Washington, it'll be like going to, going to bed on December 31st and gasoline is 3.50 a gallon and waking up the next day and it's 10.50 a gallon. That's our state economist, not me, talking. And Tom Stinson is a fairly nonpartisan individual, as, as I've learned. Thank you. Rep Representative Bills, uh, maybe we can go back to it, because I was hoping to hear specifically what you support, the details, your details sure. going forward. In, in terms forward. of Medicare? But, but first, well, and, and fiscal plan, uh, the bigger picture. But first, I want to give the senator a chance to, to respond to what you're saying. Sure. Um, well, I, when we look at how we bring this debt down, uh, one of my favorite moments in the Democratic Convention was when Bill Clinton talked about arithmetic. It's arithmetic and making sure it adds up. So you start with the cuts that we need to make, which are very important, the $2.2 trillion. I think that's incredibly important to go forward. Then you move on from there. And there has to be some mix of revenue. You don't want to do it in a way that sets the middle class back. And that's why I've specifically put out there that I would support bringing the moving forward with the Bush tax cuts, but for people making over 250000 a year to bring those to the Clinton levels. That brings in over $700 billion in additional revenue that we can use to bring the debt down. What I have to compare that with, in addition to the subsidies I talked about closing with, is the Ryan and Rand Paul budget that uh, Representative Bills has said he supports. Look at those budgets carefully, because what they do is actually add tax cuts for the wealthiest. The Ryan budget um, specifically added over, t uh, for people making over a million dollars, over $250,000 a year in tax cuts. How can that add up? How can you reduce the debt when you do that? Everyone is going to have to share in this solution, uh, so that's a major part of that. In terms of health care, I think it's really important that we keep Medicare solvent. Uh, that has got to be key as we move forward. Uh, and that's why in the Affordable Care Act, we worked very hard to keep it solvent. We looked at how can we use that Minnesota model of efficiency and high quality care, and some of the work you see up here uh, in, the, in Duluth, uh, in terms of making sure that we have hospitals that are working and we don't have people going to hospitals and getting sicker. Will you put incentives in that will encourage that kind of high quality care? I led that in the S Senate uh, so that we have a quality index, so we put incentives in our health care system so that we have health care that actually rewards high quality low cost care that's what we did with that bill and when you look at the uh the the medicare piece of that bill what did we do for seniors we filled the donut hole that's that incredibly difficult period where seniors were having to uh, pay a higher amount of the prescription drugs for themselves um, and I will say, I still remember back in 2006 when I was talking about how we needed to fill the donut hole, that uh, my daughter had heard it so much, she was over at a neighbor's, and I was in a debate uh, with Congressman Kennedy at the time, and they heard on the uh, TV me talking about donut holes, and the mom looked at my daughter and said, what is she talking about? 
And my daughter said, oh, that's when my grandma can't afford to pay her prescription drugs. That's the donut hole. Uh, those were big deals, and those were things that we got done. But when you look at how do we make Medicare work going forward, how do we keep it solvent, you have to look at this delivery system reform. Because right now, our taxpayer money from Minnesota is getting sucked down in one big transfusion tube to Florida, to states that are not nearly as efficient, where they're literally paying double the rates, double the rates for some Medicare services than we pay in Minnesota. So that is how we have to move forward, is to make sure that these other states and these other systems are working as efficiently as what we see at the Mayo Clinic and what we see uh, in a number of the areas in our state. Uh, that's what I want to do to make sure our health care system uh, is efficient and rewards high quality going forward. And I would add this, our small businesses, as we're here at the chamber, uh, have really had to pay, it's, I think it's 18% more for their health care than big businesses. That's not fair, and that's why we're allowing them to leverage their buying power uh, to go in together to these exchanges so that they can get better rates for their employees. Just one more question on the economy, and then, uh, and then we'll move on. Um, the Federal Reserve continues to deal with the sluggish economy. Just within the last couple of days, they uh, determined another round of quantitative easing, buying $40 billion of mortgage bonds per month open-ended. Uh, at a farm fest in August, Representative Bills, you spoke out against bailouts of any kind. Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke out against the TARP program, yet uh, the auto industry didn't collapse. Uh, just last week, the government sold a block of AIG stock at a profit. So is our fiscal policy somewhere in between? Is there a role for the Federal Reserve to play mm -hmm. in, in uh, strengthening the economy, or is it hands off completely? Yeah, and, and in compromise, there, there can be a role for central banking, but we have to understand that what we're doing right now is destroying the purchasing power of the middle class. We, we have to start to understand that. I mean, if you look at certainly any student of, of banking, mon monetary, uh, economic history understands that this has been done many times. We, we don't even know, we don't even really know how much the Federal Reserve has expanded our money base. We don't know because we haven't audited the Fed. That, that audit, the Fed bill passed the House 327 to 98. Now that's a bipartisan bill. And, and, I, th and I would call on Senator Klobuchar to carry that bill this coming week. Why don't we have Senate action on a bill that passed the House 327 to 98 so that the American people can finally open their eyes, have, have things exposed, transparency in, in what government does. We cannot sit up here and talk about how Wall Street, how we're against Wall Street, and then allow the Federal Reserve to continue to do what it's doing. That money is injected at the top. So if you don't like trickle-down economics, you don't like what's going on in Washington right now. Because the Federal Reserve and stimulus dollars are injected at the highest extreme of the income scale. They have at, those ind individuals have access to that money first. Where, where are the CEOs from Solyndra? Why are we not having oversight hearings to find out where they are? Uh, I believe one of them is a bundler for a candidate now, uh, helping to fundraise for them. But why is this being done? And this, so this is the crony capitalism that we've gotten to. This is what this country is, has come to, is that we spend and print and go into debt so much at the federal level that corporations, banks, would rather run to Washington to receive their, their their industry capture, their monopoly, their lockdown, rather than competing. And that's what's wrong. So, so I, have, I have a lot of problems with how our Federal Reserve is currently running its policies. I think we need to audit the Fed, which has already passed the House, 327 to 98. I think that we need to eliminate the dual mandate. We're the only central bank in the world that has a dual mandate. And that is, uh, one, the, the mandate of any central bank is to, is for, is to stabilize the money supply, to, to watch over the value of the currency. That's, that's a great goal. The other role, though, that was added in the 1970s, the late 1970s, was to ensure full employment. Well, now, anytime the unemployment rate goes over 5%, the Federal Reserve, which is an unelected body, their answer is to print money, literally digitize it. A and when they expand the money, we as the middle class, our family is hit by increased college costs, increased health care costs, increased food costs. It costs us $120 now, my family, Cindy and I, to fill up our 12-passenger daycare van with gas. So where does that money come from? Either our family has to take less money, we have to pass along those costs to our people who 
buy it, who concern who consume our daycare or we have to cut one of our we have one to three employees based on the time of the year we'll have to cut their hours that's what's happening because we are mishandling not only our monetary policy but our fiscal policy by not having a budget um and you know, I, and i find it interesting now i'm now i'm you know being tied to all these plans and i guess we'll pick and choose the plan but what's terrible again what's terrible is that the other side doesn't have a plan there is no plan there is no budget that is wrong from a fiduciary standpoint you can talk about all the bipartisan bills you've been on from here to eternity but if you haven't passed a budget and if you don't pass a budget within the next couple of weeks before we gavel out then what tom stinson has said is going to happen january 1st the fiscal cliff is going to happen the bush tax cuts the bush tax cuts were terrible economic policy you don't put temporary tax cuts in what are you doing you can't do that and i'm a guy that I'm, i'm just a labor hey folks when i got out of high school i didn't have enough money to go to college i went and worked for a living i built roads so i'm just that guy who started reading about economics and i'm i'm completely appalled at what's going on we need a we need a flat fair progressive tax system we can get that it's been calculated before two economists did it rubashka and hall they gave everybody the standard deduction so that it maintains progressivity and then they put in a flat flat rate so that Cindy and I my wife and I can do our taxes on an index card that's what we have to 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 do going forward we have to have a great vision for our economy trust me we are in dire straits we are in a solvency crisis we have to have people who are willing to put forward a great vision for this country not only economically but also in all of our different sectors whether it's mining timber ag the the, the manufacturing industries so thank you thank you senator your thoughts well, on the federal reserve and our fiscal policy well thank you very much uh, i would really look at this through the lens of what's best for minnesota and how do we work with our businesses in minnesota uh, you can call it crony capitalists i believe it's working with businesses like we have right here in this room uh, like the duluth chamber and making sure when they have trouble with red tape and things are there's a problem that i'm there to help them with that but on the larger issue of the fiscal policy i think it's very important of the federal reserve when you look at industrialized nations you see central banks like we have it's a opportunity to have an entity uh, that is not uh reporting to politicians uh their focus is on the economy and steering us through difficult economic times uh representative bills has said in april of this year that we should end the fed and that that was one of his top priorities when we got to washington i don't believe that that is our priority i believe it is steering things through difficult economic times and allowing the federal reserve to do their work does that mean we want trans- transparency of course that's why i supported uh an amendment um d- after the uh, economic crisis that we would go back and audit and figure out uh, what had happened there and the federal reserve's uh, documentation in that past and uh, we got that out it but i think our focus should be much more on how we go forward in terms of steering this economy uh through some very difficult times and to me that means putting the people of minnesota first so first of all our education system we have too many kids in high school that go on to not get jobs or they go on to one year of college i think what we should be doing is working with our two year uh, community colleges and making sure that they get degrees while they're in high school either half of a degree or a whole degree and that we bring that back we see some of that going on in the range uh, we see it at irondale high school uh, in the twin cities and i think we need to see more of that we need to have more kids and yes i support stem programs more kids going into science and technology and engineering and math uh, i think that's incredibly important uh, to move this economy forward and then we need to bring our debt down in a balanced way uh, which we have uh, discussed here at length and again i want to explain to people here a budget in the senate is what we did with the budget control act was signed into law by the president 2.2 trillion dollars in reductions a budget in the senate is a resolution that's how it works it's not even signed into law it is important to have one i think we need one but i want to make very clear that what we did actually had the force of law the 2.2 trillion dollars in reductions and that 
That, which has been criticized here today, was the compromise. That was where you had Republicans that were willing to compromise working with Democrats to make that initial step in bringing down our spending. And much more needs to be done. But I want to emphasize to people to look at the choices here. We agree that we need to bring down our debt, but look at the choices about how we do it and who will be the ones on the short end of the stick if we do it the wrong way. It won't be the wealthy people if you add more taxes cuts for them. It's going to be the hardworking people up here in northern Minnesota. Thank you very much. Uh, staying with domestic issues, I guess, I'd like to hear both from both of you a little bit about your stand on uh, transportation and transportation funding. Uh, big issue, you know, in Minnesota, of course, with the bridge collapse in Minneapolis and, and also with uh, a lot of our infrastructure damage here in Duluth in June, which you, you touched upon. But uh, there's been lots in the headlines about the gas tax, about uh, high, the need for highway maintenance, high-speed rail, uh, the proposed vehicle miles traveled tax, and other ideas. So I, I guess, I, like I say, I just want to hear, are we moving forward in the correct way as far as, as, as funding transportation, and are we funding it enough? Senator? Well, uh, first of all, I think you all know I've advocated very strongly for a number of transportation projects up here. We're seeing the airport expansion, something that I worked on, uh, and I'm very um, looking forward to that day when we uh, open the new terminal there. Uh, you see the work that's gone on in port, again, an uh, emphasis of mine. Um, and you see uh, a lot of the road construction, broadband, internet, the works that's been up here through the Recovery Act and through some of the other uh, uh, work that we've done over the years. With transportation, the update there is against all odds. The Senate actually produced a bipartisan bill, a two-year bill. I would have liked to see a five-year bill, but it was a two-year bill uh, that's $700 million for Minnesota that goes directly to our state and allows our state to make the decisions on what projects should be funded. Um, that was something we worked very hard on, and then because of the public sentiment that we had to move forward on transportation, we were able to get it through the House. I led the bill in the Senate this fall, had my name on it. Uh, we got 51 votes and were blocked by the filibuster that would have been even bigger transportation in terms of looking at an infrastructure bank, something that's traditionally had bipartisan support uh, in Congress, and that are Republican Democrats working together to say, why don't we leverage uh, some of the public money with private money to have an infrastructure bank for the major projects? That's something that I'm hopeful uh, that can be a compliment, co accomplished uh, next year in a bipartisan way. Uh, so transportation funding is key. It's not just key for the immediate jobs. We know it produces those. I see some of our uh, construction workers out there in the audience. But it's also key uh, for the economy that we want to be. How else do you get the iron ore uh, over to the port of Duluth? if you don't have a good train system and then you don't have a good port that's working? How else do you get our barges down the Mississippi River uh, if the locks are falling apart? We need to be creative about how we move forward with transportation, but it's not just a key thing for jobs right now, and I know that's how people talk about it a lot. It's also key for moving forward. That's why I worked on the Stillwater Bridge uh, to get um, uh, permission to move forward with that project. That bridge was falling apart. Uh, it, we needed to have a bridge down there, and I know I got some grief for it, but it was the right thing to do. That's why I worked on uh, getting the immediate funding with Senator Coleman uh, for the 35W bridge when that collapsed, and we got that done literally in a matter of months, and that bridge was rebuilt, that eight-line highway, um, literally within a year. Um, that's incredible. It's a tribute to the workers and the people of Minnesota, but it's also an example uh, that when you have someone in Washington that's willing to work across the aisle and put transportation and jobs in the future of the country first, you get things done for your state. Thank you. Representative Bills? Yeah, and I think we did so at the, at the state level, too, with Governor Dayton, and, and that's a really bipartisan way forward. But we should do more than just poll and find that if you mention bipartisan 15 times in a debate, that's the way forward. Okay, you, you have to be willing to go into Washington and, you know, we lost, a, we lost a, our, our, we had a family at Rosemount High School. I taught Andrew Hausman. Um, he's now at Harvard. He's a great student. Um, he lost his dad in the bridge collapse. So when I read about things that we've added, we've had 5,000, over 5,500 uh, pedestrian bike and walkways uh, added since 2009 when we could be funding our bridges, our roads, our locks and dams, uh, but they're not, maybe they're just not as exciting as the, as the bike and, and walkways. And, and clearly, you know, I've biked to work 85% of the time uh, d during a, a kind of a four-year period before I went into elected office. So I love to bike. I, lo I love the outdoors. I love to walk. But you also have to prioritize when you're facing a budget crisis that we're in right now. Why are we doing these? What, $28 million for a history, a transportation history museum? 
when we have roads and bridges and locks and dams that are falling apart, I think it's all about priorities, and it's about having oversight. Again, it's a, and it's not that exciting, folks, but, but, in, but in a bipartisan way, you can have oversight over, over our transportation programs, hundreds of different transportation programs that are added again. Uh, but what major thing that you have to watch out for is earmarks. And we still have a problem with earmarks, those specific programs that don't have the mathematical details or reality in terms of what their return is. You know, anybody economically speaking from Adam Smith to Karl Marx understands that where there's a role for government. I'm a public school teacher. I know there's a role for government. I understand that. Uh, when we did that, when, when we built the, the infrastructure in this country, the, the interstate highway system, the locks and dams, those were great, great ideas, great ways forward. But we also have to understand that Bloomberg and Variant Perception has put out a study that shows that our return on investment of public dollars is falling because clearly patching a hole in the road is not the same return or rebuilding the road is not the same return as putting the road in in the first place. And when we're, just, when, when we're literally throwing money into, into projects rather than prioritizing them or indexing them, and transportation agencies can do this, we just have to, we have to make sure that we work and, and move forward in a, in a way that has, a, a, again, a great vision for transportation. And, and something that might not create the, the best photo op, but you're doing things that help economic activity. Uh, I think broadband is a, another way. We have to be careful of how we implement it. We have to make sure that it's not, that it's not broadband to nowhere, but that it's broadband to help and, and foster uh, innovation and entrepreneurialism. But, but I think it's critical to bring, to bring uh, high-speed internet and broadband to, uh, to people in rural areas, specifically in, 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 in education. Uh, my, my high school, our faculty uh, took a visit, so this is how things can be done at a local level. During our workshop at Rosemount High School this year, which I was a part of, we went to the, the Dakota County Technical College. And this was great because for years, many of us teachers have been pushing back because we try to push so hard as a faculty and administration to make sure that every kid goes to a four-year college. Well, eight, you know, we're proud of 86% of our kids going to a four-year institution. But when we got to when we, when we arrived at the Dakota County Technical College, Dr. Thomas, their president, was, was quick to remind us that they have people attending their college who have four-year de four -year degrees from everywhere, including Carleton, which is an incredible university, very expensive university, a very expensive college. They're coming back to Dakota County Technical College to get the skills to get a job. They can't even keep instructors at that college in, in IT or being a linesman or the certified auto tech programs because those people can make so much money in the private sector. So that's where we, and, and I've been pushing those students that I have to, to make sure that they realize what their career goals are. Where are the jobs? Are you looking at, at industry where the jobs are? are? Are you doing that? Not just saying that you're going to go to that four-year school and, and get that degree, uh, but what is that degree in? And what specific field? So it takes people at the local level, again. And that's why we should block grant more of our funding out. If you want to help teachers, if you want to help administrators, I carried a bill that was bipartisan right down the road, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, every teacher uh, in the House, except for Corey Kath, who did say that he supported it, but Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, about education boards, a process that would have gotten 95% of the funding right to the principal at the local level. That's how you create a way forward in education. And that's how you create a way forward in transportation funding, too, is make sure that those local individuals can prioritize the projects that they need. Thank you. And we're fortunate here in uh, northeastern Minnesota to have the taconite industry at full production. Senator, your grandfather worked in the mines, I believe, so you know as well as anyone the importance of that circumstance. Uh, Polymet and Twin Metals are uh, exploring now and are considering that there could be a significant uh, non-ferrous mining industry created, uh, yet Polymet has spent tens of millions of dollars in several years getting to the point where they're at, and they still have a long ways to go. Uh, what can we do about the permitting process, the regulatory environment, to encourage uh, these kinds of endeavors? Well, uh, first of all, as you, as you noted, uh, mining's been a big part of my life. My grandpa worked 1,500 feet underground in the mines. Uh, he knew what it meant to have the mines closed down. 
um, that happened to him. He then went on to be a logger. And there's been so many ups and downs in northern Minnesota, but right now we're seeing a resurgence uh, with uh, so many of our mining uh, projects with U.S. Steel and Cleveland Cliffs uh, going strong, and that's been really important to the region. We've literally seen um, the unemployment, which was at its height in some of the towns in Virginia and Hibbing at 18 and 19 percent a few years ago, cut in half. It's not where we want to be. There's more work to be done. And I think one of those things is to be smart um, about how we do uh, the regulatory processes uh, going forward. Uh, it's been uh, incredibly frustrating for me, especially some of the things the EPA has done in the uh, regulatory area with farming. Um, I've been uh, one of the first ones there to fight them on regulating dust and regulating uh, manure and regulating milk spills, um, and also to push them on some of the issues up here. I just this last week on an issue of uh, uh, haze with our taconite um, plants, which could have caused uh, a real problem, joined with three other senators. I led the letter uh, to explain to them how uh, we didn't have the technology to meet those standards. I think the same with the permitting uh, that we have to keep pushing. We want to make sure that permitting process is in place so that we keep our safety rules um, there, but we want to make sure it moves as swiftly as possible. So I have been directly working. I'm meeting with U.S. Steel uh, tomorrow uh, in my office in Washington. I've been working directly with uh, the companies uh, to make sure that we can move these permitting processes as quickly as possible and get these uh, projects moving. Your Representative Bills? Yeah, I've actually spent uh, quite a bit of time on this, having spent time uh, in the laborers' union. It's very important to me. My dad's a retired pipe fitter out of 690. I was in the laborers' local 464. So getting, getting men and women to work is obviously uh, the great way forward in, in terms of uh, solving, uh, actually parting, part of it in, in terms of solving our fiscal problems. Uh, so what I, what I did was I went to work and learned a little bit about Canada's One Project, One Review. And, and this is a policy that Canada, who has very high standards, has put in place, and they've found great success with it. Um, and then, even to, to caution myself, I, I said, well, I'm going to find somebody who's really good with the environment, who, who's been around, who's very experienced. So I have a senior advisor. His name's Al Kui. So I went and talked to Governor Kui about this process. And I said, would you please research this and, and look into Canada's one project, one review, and if it's a way forward? And I received a great email back from him in detail. He's, he's such a wonderful man. And he said, you know, I, I've been cautious about these things for many years, but this, what, what Canada has done is the way forward here, that you can streamline the process, have it transparent, and make sure that the federal government is running and, and in a very linear way, making sure that all the permitting is put in place so that you can get these operations up and running in a hurry because Governor Quee knows that what, the shape that we're in financially, and he knows that we have to get... We have, to, we have to have that North Dakota growth here in Minnesota as well and across the country. So it was great to talk to him about that. I was fairly shocked to find that, that people surrounding PolyMet think that it's normal to wait 10, well, it could take 10 years. That's simply unacceptable. We have to have a better vision, and I think through Canada's One Project, One Review, uh, we can do that. Um, and we can make sure that we put timelines on, on these review processes and, and also make sure that it's not, a, not overburdensome. Some of our corporations, you know, whether it's uh, Shell or Chevron, uh, people involved in, in, in mineral extraction or, or uh, mining or, or drilling, they have huge legal and compliance offices. By economies of scale, these great big corporations again, uh, and certainly are, there are some great corporations, but then there are also people who, who uh, corporations who are so big that they don't mind seeing all of these regulations put in place. They have the economies of scale to get around them. That blocks out small and medium-sized corporations from even getting involved. So once again, we've come to this point in this country where we're right back to the Adam Smith of it, is we have a large government, a huge government, that's spending massive amount of dollars, creating thousands of pages of regulation, and then we have large mercantilists or large corporations that are coming along and saying, that's okay, we'll, we'll be a part of that. And certainly that's, that's great if you want to fill up your campaign coffers, for your next re-election because they're going to have to come to D.C. seeking their favors. But what we can't do is we can't go forward like that. We have to have a better vision. We have to have a better vision for, for mineral extraction. We have to have a better, better vision for our environment. And, and simply put, uh, that is following Canada's lead. They're a great trade partner with us. You know, you know they're our largest trade partner? And we only have a, they're larger than, lar larger than China. And we only have a $37 billion trade deficit with Canada. So maybe we should do things like 
natural gas exploration. Maybe we should be encouraging trade with Canada because it certainly is a better situation right now with Canada than it is with China where we have a $300 billion trade deficit where $300 billion are going overseas because we're not acting on the Doha round of the World Trade Organization talks to encourage free trade. We're not doing those things because maybe nobody understands what Doha is or maybe it doesn't help you get reelected. But that's the way forward in this country is to do those things so that we're not dealing with sending $300 billion to China in 2011 in the current account and then in the capital account $300 billion comes back buying our debt buying our mines, buying our fields, and buying our banks. Thank you both. Uh, in the interest of keeping within our time constraints and wanting to give you both adequate time to have some closing comments, I think we'll leave the questions there, Chuck, and, and allow the closing comments. And we started with you, Senator, so Representative Bills, maybe you'd like to have the final remarks? Sure. I, I think this is a very important election. Again, this really isn't, uh, for, for me, this isn't a Senator Klobuchar versus Representative Bills as much it is, as it is finding somebody who's going to go forward and, and work really hard with those kids that I've taught in mind that we have to put a compromise on the table. I've mentioned it before. For me, saying that I would vote for the Simpson Bowls or the Great Compromise is like somebody on Monday morning saying that they could have made that throw that Ponder missed. So you really can't do that. But what you can do is you can say, that's why I'm going to Washington. I'm going to Washington because I think, I don't think it's just a Mr. Smith goes to Washington thing. And, and Senator Klobuchar has pointed out at Farm Fest that she doesn't believe in Mr. Smith goes to Washington. I don't think we need one Mr. Smith goes to Washington. I think we need a hundred Mr. Smiths goes to Washington and Mrs. Smith goes to Washington. That's what we need. We need people who have a greater vision, who are not going to treat an election like a lottery. Where, hey, I won the election, I become a millionaire, I stay in Washington, D.C., and this is what I do. We need people, we need everyday, ordinary people. We need more teachers, more farmers, more, more people who work in the mines, people who are stay-at-home moms and dads. And, and I'm so glad that in this state, we live in a state where I, as a person of, of meager means, just a public school teacher, can actually find his way through the process and actually run for office. You don't have to be a political elite in this state. You don't have to be a financial elite in this state to get through and actually run and try to make a difference. And that means a lot to me, and we need to keep the rules in place in our parties that make sure that that happens. And so I'm not only going to fight in the, in, the, in the United States Senate, I'm going to fight within my party to make sure that a process is maintained where regular, everyday people can be a part of it. You know, simply put, this is all, we have major deficits. I think we, I've counted six major deficits. We have a budget deficit we've talked about extensively. We have a jobs deficit where if you would just go and, and put together a rain, something like called the RAINS Act, where you could vote on this, we put this measure forward, regulations from the executive in need of scrutiny. We need to take, Congress needs to take its responsibilities back. We need to have a Senate that debates and where there's discourse. It is the highest, most deliberative body in the world. And certainly, we can be civil. It's OK to be passionate. Again, trust me, in the teacher's lounge, we get fairly passionate about things. We discuss political issues. But then the next day, we come back, and, and we have lunch again together. It's OK to have discussion and debate. Just don't close it off. And make sure that you're doing your job in oversight. And again, I know these things don't sound very, uh, very exciting. But when we have this much duplication in government, when we have 47 job training programs run by nine different agencies, because, just because every individual wanted their own job training program put through so that they look good on their, on their campaign literature. This is the problem, folks, is that we have duplication, no oversight. Uh, 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 we have, a, in the last six years, we've added 225,000 federal executive workforce personnel. They are going to regulate the mines. They are going to regulate the farms. That's what they do. We need to go push back on that. And again, this isn't extreme to say, I'm a public school teacher. I understand there's a role for government. But if we're going to fund my classroom so that I don't have 38 kids in a class, which I have every morning, then we need to make sure that we have a private sector that is thriving and vibrant. And, and that way, we have the tax base to fund my classroom. So we need some type of an equilibrium, and we need to do it now. As, as our state economist said, if nothing is done in the next week or two weeks in Washington, we will go off the fiscal cliff. Tom Stinson has, has laid it out quite succinctly. 
January 1st, after January 1st, we will slip into a recession. And that recession will be the solvency crisis turning into a liquidity crisis. We have to do something now. And if people do not act in Washington, and make sure that you study, and make sure that you understand, because a lot of times there's nothing, you know, don't underestimate career politicians and the power of necessity. I wrote that down this morning. Because watch for that to be done in Washington, Republican and Democrat. We need a United States Senator who's going to understand that these are times of America versus Washington. We need to go and take our government back. And I thank you so much for attending today. And I thank the Chamber and, and, the, and the Playhouse here and also the Duluth uh, News for, for putting this on. Thank you. Senator, your closing thoughts? Thank you very much. Uh, I want to start with the core here. Um, as I mentioned, uh, my grandpa worked 1,500 feet underground in the mines in Ely, Minnesota, and he never graduated from high school. He saved money in a coffee can in his basement so he could send my dad to college. My dad went to what is now Vermilion Community College, and then he went on to the University of Minnesota to get a journalism degree. He came from that hard scrabble life in northern Minnesota and went on to interview everyone from Mike Ditka to Ronald Reagan to Ginger Rogers. My mom got her teaching degree in Milwaukee. She came to Minnesota and she taught kindergarten and then she taught second grade. And she taught second grade until she was 70 years old. So I'm here, up here in Duluth this morning as the granddaughter of an iron ore miner and the daughter of a teacher and a journalist and the first woman elected to the Senate from Minnesota. Now I want that for every other little girl and little boy in this state. I want them to have those opportunities. I want kids that grow up in northern Minnesota to be able to stay in Minnesota and live in northern Minnesota and have a job in northern Minnesota. And I feel the same way about the rest of our state. And the way you do that is to make sure that you're working on things that matter to the people of this state. Yes, we should have endless debates in the Senate. We will have those. We do have those. But what matters to me is the real results. And that's what I've done for the last six years. When the businesses in this room have come to me with problems, with exports, with opening markets, when they've come to me uh, with issues, with red tape, I have stood up for them and helped them. That's been important to me because I know that it means jobs and that the jobs come from the private sector. When individual citizens have come to me and said, you know what? I lost a leg in Iraq and the go government's not giving me the benefits because they lost the records at Walter Reed. I've stood up for them and personally made the calls and helped them. I believe that's part of the job of the senator. But the other part of the job that's equally important is moving forward for this country. And I've outlined for you today what I believe we need to do as a country. And that is not to just rely on churning money on Wall Street, but to move forward like you're doing in Duluth. To move forward with making things in America again, inventing stuff, exporting to the world. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by making sure we have a strong education system, not by kicking the can down the road on education in the state legislature, but actually making sure we have an education system that works. You do that by making sure those markets are open and we have an even playing field with our foreign competitor. That means jobs in America. The boats should be going that way as they're starting to do with those Cirrus planes and those Epicurean cutting boards made right here in Duluth instead of coming this way. You have to make sure you bring the debt down in a balanced way. You've seen two very different visions here. And I know there's been a lot of talk and rhetoric, but remember, adding $250,000 per person in tax cuts for people making over a million dollars a year as proposed by the budget that Representative Bills has said he supports and are his priority are not going to bring that debt down like we need to do in a balanced way. It's going to take sacrifice from everyone. It's going to take spending cuts, but it's also going to take comprehensive tax reform and looking at it in a way where we actually bring the business rates down so we encourage business development in America, but also looking at some of those individual rates. I've been willing to stand up for the people of this state and this country and do that. And it finally means looking at red tape and rules and regulations in a very thoughtful way and figure out with tourism, as I've done, how do you make it easier for foreign tourists to come and spend an average of $5,000 and go to grandma's and go up on the North Shore and go fishing out in Ely? How do you do that? Well, it takes hard work and it takes looking at those rules and proposing individual changes as I've done from everything from the medical device industry on down. That's what I want to keep doing for this state. And I know there wouldn't be a parade waiting for me at home when I voted, took some of those tough votes to make sure that our financial system stayed strong when I stood by and made sure that we kept working on getting ourselves out of this mess to get to that point of stability where Duluth can say we are open for business 
That's what you need in the United States Senate, and that's what I want to continue to do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you both for your thoughtful discussion this morning. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Chuck, and the Duluth News Tribune. Thank you, audience, for your consideration. I'd ask if you take a moment on the leaflet that you were handed as you walked in on the flip side. There's an evaluation of the civility project goals. If you take a moment to fill those out and hand them in on your way out, we'd appreciate it. Thanks for being with us, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, great. You have a wonderful day.